topic. So today we have two topics of uh, journal reading. The first topic is by uh, Dr. Kevin Chen. He will talk about the comparison of accuracy of max theory positioning between using splints and templates in two jaw or sonaxis surgery. Uh, Kevin, please. Uh, thanks, Professor Lin, and uh, good morning, everyone. And I'm the sixth year resident, Kevin. Today, I'll present the first journal reading. Okay, and the topic today is the comparison of the accuracy of maxillary repositioning between using splints and templates in two jaw or somatic surgery. And this paper was published in the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in May this year. Okay, the introduction. Advances in uh, CAT CAM techniques allow simulation of dorsal surgery scan in a computer software program and a fabrication of occlusal splint using a 3D printer. The mode to execute a digital plan on the actual patient using an intermediate splint has not been changed. This mode remains var variable due to the mispositioning of the condyle. The splitness techniques uh, have been proposed to correct the position of maxilla in relation to the skull rather than the mandible, which includes the navigation, patient-specific osteosynthesis, and bone support templates. It's been reported that the maxilla can be translated accurately due to the independence of condylar positioning. From the previous bone supported, which can also called the splinter surgical template proposed by the authors, they had guaranteed the osteotomy line and the movement of the maxilla. And also they have done a randomized control trial, which shows that this template performed better than printed occlusal splints in a superior inferior direction of maxillary surgical movements, which results in a smaller maxilla deviation between the plane and the post-surgical locations. They had hypothesized that in two jaw orthognatic surgery, the accuracy of maxillary repositioning is closely correlated with the degree of complexity of the surgical movement plan. It's been reported that cases where the maxilla is being moved for a longer distance correlates with less maxillary repositioning accuracy. So the purpose of this study was to analyze and compare the accuracy of transferring maxillary positioning using the digital occlusal splints, the DOS, and the digital templates, the DTS, in simple and complicated cases. And the application of the templates could improve surgical accuracy and complicated cases correlate with less accuracy was hypothesized. So the aim of this study was to quantitatively estimate the difference between the plain and realized maxillary position in two jaw orthognatic surgery. Material methods. A total 70 patients were enrolled and the inclusion criteria were the age range from 18 to 40 years old. And the patients were diagnosed with skeletal dental facial deformity and need by maxillary orthognatic surgery to correct it. The exclusion criteria includes the unilateral or bilateral cleft lip and palate, patient diagnosed with craniofacial syndrome, and craniofacial deformity caused by uh, tumor, trauma, or iogenic factors, and patients that previously underwent orthognathic surgery or they whom has scheduled for maxillary segmental osteotomy. Further then, uh, the author then further defined the complicated cases where the patients, when impaction movement was more than two millimeters, the occlusal plane canting was more than three degrees, or the midline discrepancies were more than 2.5 millimeters. About the interventions, preliminary surgical planning was accomplished by clinical examination and preoperative radiographic measurements, including spiral CT, panorex, and lateral and posterior anterior x-rays. The patient's surgical procedures were simulated using a computer software program and the imaging data were imported into this software to construct a composite skull model. Dental arch models scanned by laser replaced the teeth on the CT scan for higher accuracy. And the clinicians stimulated and visualized a virtual surgical process, including the level one osteotomy, BSSOs, and the reposition, the maxillofacial bone until the most satisfactory result was obtained. 
of the patients were, used, uh, were treated by the maxillary first approach. Uh, first, we, we see the splint group. The patients in the DOS cohort, they used the, uh, the software Streamatic version 11 to engineer an intermediate digital splint to align the maxillary position according to the native mandible. And another digital splint was designed for the final occlusion. Finally, the 3D printer in their department was used to fabricate the intermediate digital splint, like the um, figure A. About the surgical procedures, the teeth in the upper jaw and lower jaw were positioned in the intermediate splint after left the one of steatomy and then were tied with a power chain. The maxilla was repositioned with guidance from the native mandible to the satisfactory position after bony interferences were removed. About the digital template group, uh, one set of templates based on the surface of the maxilla was devised to confirm the level one osteotomy line, which was shown in the figure A. And another set of templates for moving the maxilla independent of the native mandible was shown in uh, figure B. A final digital splint was also created to move the mandible to the pre-designed position. About the surgical procedures, the first set of the template were placed on the surface of the maxilla and the level one osteotomy lines were determined by the internal indicatrix of these templates. And after bony interferences were removed, the repositioning templates were installed with screw holes matching those corresponding holes determined by the cutting templates. About the study variables, all the patients went for CT scan uh, follow-ups on post-op day seven. The primary outcomes were the average deviation between the planned and realized locations of the eight selected points on the maxillary teeth. Those points were set as uh, the central incisor mesial points, canine cuspids, first premolar buccal cuspids, and first molar mesial buccal cuspids on each side, which this was um, uh, published by the authors last year. Based on the skull region involved in the surgery, the planning model and post-op model were matched by surface registration technique in the software. And the medial lateral, intro posterior, and superior inferior directions were defined as X, Y, and Z axis, respectively, according to their previous studies. So the predictor variables are the first operative complexity, the simple versus complicated cases, and the technique for positioning of the maxilla, the printed occlusal splint versus the printed templates, the DOS versus the DTS. The relationships of primary outcome variable with coverage such as age and planned surgical movement were further analyzed. So the conventional non-parametric uh, statistical methods were used see the results. Okay, um, the total 70 patients were enrolled and they were separated into four groups, the DOS cohort, the DTS cohort, and uh, a complicated and simple cases for each. And all patients recovered without operative complications. First, we see the accuracy of the splint versus the template include both simple and complicated cases. As for the simple movement, which was the group one for the DOS group and group three in the D DTS group. Uh, the DOS group, the average was 1.33 millimeters and the DTS was 1.06 millimeters, which has shown no statistical significance. As for the complicated movement, uh, which were the group two and group four, and as for the DOS group, it was 2.47 millimeters and the DTS group was 1.37 millimeters and which had show statistical significance. The P was 0 0.002. And then we see the subgroup XYZ analysis, the complicated DTS cohort, the, the group four, which the average was all less than 1.0 millimeters. You can see in the uh, X axis, the, the average was 0 0.3 and the y-axis is 0 0.98, and the z-axis was 0 0.7. And all those data were smaller than that in the corresponding data of the complicated DOS, uh, the G2 group in y-axis. However, the comparison between the simple movement of the DOS and DT cohorts did not show a statistically significance in all 
uh, three axes. Next, the accuracy of the splints and templates between simple and complicated movements. This, uh, the eight selected points of simple movement case of DOS was 1.33 millimeter in group one, uh, which has, was smaller than the complicated DOS group two, 1.55. The P was 0 0.002. However, there are no significant difference between simple and complicated movement cases using the templates, the G, uh, group three versus uh, group four. The P was 0 0.116. As for the subgroup XYZ analysis, the complicated movement DOS cohort on Y axis was 1.89, group two, and which was larger than the corresponding data of simple movement of DOS cohort, which was 0 0.55 in group one. The P was less than 0 0.001, but there are also no significance on X and Z directions. Also, all XYZ directions on the digital template groups, the G4 and G3, all show no significance. And the results of covariates versus primary outcomes. The relationship between age and average deviation had shown no significance. The P was 0 0.469. And the plan complicated movements of the splint group, G2, and the average deviation showed no significant correlation. It showed significant correlation. The P was 0 0.021, and the Spearman coefficient, coefficient R is the 0 0.554. However, the amount of the uh, planned simple movement, simple case in the DOS and DTS complete cases uh, in DTS all show no significant correlation with primary outcomes. Let's see the discussion. Their hypothesis was that the application of the uh, templates could even prove surgical accuracy. And the aim of this study was quantitatively evaluating the deviation between the plan and realized maxilla positioning. The result had shown that planned complicated maxillary movement, the DTS cohort in group four, experienced a discrepancy of less than two millimeters. The deviation is smaller than using the splint in this group. So the template performed better than splint in repeat positioning maxilla when maxillary impaction, occlusal plane canting, and midline discrepancy correction was needed. In the subgroup investigation of maxilla control in diverse directions. And for the Y axis, which also is called the anterior posterior direction in this article, the utilization of templates could reduce the diversion versus the splint. However, in simple cases, there was no significance between the template group or the splint groups. As for other evidence, some splintless technologies, such as intra-op navigation and patient-specific osteosynthesis, have been introduced in previous studies, which they have suggested that the surgical splints have inherent shortcomings, not much, no matter where, whether they are manually made or printed. Further inaccuracy generated from using splints could be overcome by the splintless methods due to the independence of condylar sitting and ex excellent vertical control of the maxillary position. However, increased cost and preparation time limit the application of these techniques, which still lack of the consensus, which is the best. And this study correlates the complexity degree of maxillary movement plan with the precision of the surgical outcomes. And for the uh, template group in complicated cases, which also often require more bony removal, has a relatively consistent outcomes. Also, no matter complicated or simple movement plan, the accuracy of maxillary movement can still be guaranteed by the templates. In contrast, complicated case using the uh, splints may result in more obvious inaccuracies. So their recommendation was that using the templates rather than the splints in complicated movements, especially in the anterior posterior direction, the Y axis. There's uh, some in limitation of this study First, there's further concern about the transfer accuracy in different maxi regions when using the DOS and templates. The authors consider the structure of templates of, and hypothesize that the position, positional control in the maxillary anterior region 
might outperform the, uh, the DOS, the splint group. There might be no difference in the accuracy among different regions for digital splints. So in conclusion, the 3D printed cutting and repositioning templates could improve the accuracy of delivering the surgical plan to the operation room when compared to printed occlusal splints. And the application of the digital templates could bring an ideal treatment option for maxi repositioning in two jaw surgery, especially when dealing with complicated cases. And further research about transferring accuracy of different maxillary regions in different types of cases is warranted to fully explore for prospective comparisons. That's my presentation today. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Bang Yun Zhou, Zhou Yi Shi. Could you give us some uh, comments about this uh, paper? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Actually, this paper is the discussing by the two more advanced techniques to plan the OGS the outcome and the, to know, evaluate the accuracy. Uh, in our center, we uh, focus on the DOS. That means we use the two screen method to design the simulations. And uh, we actually had no experience in the DPS uh, studies. And uh, this paper is divided into two groups and there is a much similar cases cohort. Uh, however, all the both cohort can separate into the two different labels, the cases. The one is a simple, the second one is complicated cases. Uh, as my uh, very little experience uh, in, uh, in the, the, the two different uh, cohort, I think for easy or for simple cases, because this paper only talking about uh, the four uh, positions pre and post. So based on the method first the cases, once we're using the uh, single uh, the spring method, uh, we perform the intermediate stain based on the, all the manifold uh, potential arch. And then for the simple cases, I think always we can get a very good uh, level one positions. Uh, however, in my experience for some difficult cases, once we perform uh, more advancement or more downward or more uh, upward, once the conduct could be a uh, rotation for a little more degrees, uh, somehow in my, my, my experience, probably the, the forward position will be altered by maybe the unpredicted uh, uh, scenarios. So actually, once in this scenario, probably we can use the template guided method, but uh, hard for us to use because in our center, uh, probably and no, it's no any uh, company or some uh, vendors can offer this kind of uh, facilities. So for some difficult cases, it probably is our uh, good um, suggestion to use the DTS group guidance because for some complicated cases, uh, once we use the template method for more advancement or for more extruded cases, uh, we could guide it based on the template uh, guided, that probably will be a more stronger or more stable position for the four and the four the fixation. I think this is my personal experience. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhou. And uh, Professor Zhang, Frank, could you give yes. us some uh, suggestion and recommendation? Yeah, uh, I have a question and the one uh, suggestion. The first, uh, the question is, uh, is there any uh, international guideline for definition of complicated cases? Or the also define uh, how is the complicated disease uh, cases? Uh, Dr. Um, Kevin, can we go back yeah. to the slide? Sure. I think this part may be uh, defined by the author themselves. Uh, we have uh, we have also don't doctor uh, no 
No, I also don't think that for you. Okay. So Kevin, do you have some answer? Okay. Um, I think um because uh the, the authors based this study on their previous study and also in the previous study they defined this kind of uh, criteria by themselves. So I'm pretty not sure whether there's a standard uh definition for the complicated cases, but I maybe I will look for it. Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Yes, Yixuan, uh, Chen. Yixuan, Chen Yixuan. Dr. Chen, are you there? Uh, Dr. Frank, do you? Uh, so, what's your concern, main concern about this criteria? Yes. Uh... You know, the midnight deviation two millimeter is very easy to uh, encounter in our cases. Moreover, impaction two more millimeter for all the gummy smile, they are uh, by the definition complicated cases. Uh, I wanna comment is our advantage is uh, CAP OGS. Uh, since recently, uh, more and more uh, CAP cases, uh, minor cases of uh, CAP cases, uh, uh, would, because of the patient's demand, we, we proceed for the orthognathic surgery. So uh, I think it's a good uh, chance to study uh, comparison accuracy between complicated cases or not complete cases, uh, 3D simulation between correct cases. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my question to to the uh, to this paper is that uh, since he included the, the two jaw uh, surgery as a criteria for the selection of patient, but why the uh, why the measurements just focus on the uh, the the maxilla? So uh, is there any uh, factor affecting the, the accuracy of uh, of the uh, maxilla by the mandible, or the mandibular accuracy is out of the 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 range of the uh, control? So uh, maybe maybe we can uh, do uh, do some. It, my my question is uh, whether when we do the one jaw surgery, the maxilla only, and then we we compare the the two uh, two different type of method, would that be would there be uh, some difference, significant difference between these two methods? Then we can we can say uh, more precisely that the these two type of method has some difference. Uh, that that's my personal thinking. Uh, Professor Ray Chen, do you have some comments? Uh, not really, because I do not play myself. Number one, number two is that I'm always thinking that. Uh, this kind of plate uh, cutting and then the plate position. I wonder this uh, pose that can maintain, number one, the midnight shift is easy to maintain, advancement intrusion is easy, but for the pitch, uh, especially for still intrusion, where all this screw position in, is that strong enough to hold the, the, same, uh, the, the same position of the method up where we want, and this is previously designed. Well, I think it's possible that uh, for simple cases and for complicated, uh, well, they do not define the clap as uh, Frank mentioned about the, the clap surgery, but I think that for asymmetry and as well for uh, curved rotate uh, surgery first cases that we do intrude posterior uh, mesilla a lot. 
And in that kind of a position, in this uh, uh, pre-surgical guide and then position, is that is helpful? Well, we can try that, uh, but all the cost of this kind of a model printing out and uh, fix, fix it. Uh, well, I, I think that in our center, we can do a very similar studies. If Dr. Zhou and Dr. Yao, Dr. Zhang, I think that it's worthwhile. Yeah, it's, it's possible. But for our practice, I think that seems, seems to be this kind of a, a change is very minimum. Thank you. Thank you. And um, my, my another question is that uh, this paper mentioned about the, uh, the complexity of the uh, movement, but uh, because we, when we move the, the, comp, uh, the, the MMC, usually we have a six degree of uh, freedom, including the rotational uh, change. Uh, however, in this paper, it seems that uh, they could not find out the significance between the, the accuracy of the uh, rotation of freedom and only mentioned about the, uh, the linear movement. And, and just finally, just the, uh, the y direction, the y axis uh, movement has been noted that uh, useful when we use the uh, template. Uh, so, so I don't know, uh, maybe, maybe there, there are something in the rotational part, uh, that could not achieve the, the significance of, uh, difference. So if you concern only the AP, uh, the Y axis represented AP, right? Uh, Dr. Kevin. Yes. So, so the, the only thing is, and how much is the difference of the amount between the, uh, the positional error? Uh, the average is shown on this chart uh, for the group four is 0 0.98 and uh, group three is 0 0.59 and group two, the, uh, uh, the splint group, where the complicated cases were 1.89, and for the simple cases in the spring group was 0 0.55. Okay, so so basically there's uh, probably around one millimeter difference between the complicated case. Yes. By by using the uh, the spring part and the the splint and and the template group. So. So by this uh, one millimeter, uh, just like uh, sometimes we, we, when we use the intermediate spring to, to position the maxilla, sometimes we feel that the, uh, the maxilla seems not advanced as we planned or uh, set back as we planned. So uh, probably this part can, we can pay more attention to, to, uh, to the, to the, our current method because we use most of our cases uh, by, by the occlusal splint. And uh, Bo Fang, Dr. Bo Fang, could you give us some uh, comments? Because yesterday we, we saw you uh, perform one surgery that the, it seems that the AP position is not completely the same as uh, as the plan. Uh, I think when we use, sometimes I think uh, in my little experience, if the intermediate spleen is more thick, it's uh, seeing the maxilla position usually not that as uh, we expected in the CT simulation. And what, what I experienced in the surgery. And uh, I think uh, Professor Law had a paper about using template, uh, cutting guide and position guide uh, in some of the clap cases. And I think in that paper, he showed a very good accuracy uh, 
after the surgery. So, so I think template may, may have some uh, position or may have some role in, uh, in not your surgery, but I have no experience about this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yao. Is Dr. Yao? Dr. Yao, can you give us some comments? Uh, I have I have one question uh, about do uh, Kevin do do you see the direction? I mean, you you just show to us the accuracy or the deviation from planning. Uh, the most the highest amplitude of arrow seems to be in sagittal, right? The y axis. Uh, do they show? They just show absolute number, or do they show the direction? In my, to my knowledge, I think most of time when we use occlusal splint, the sagittal position most of time is uh, relatively backward. The the real position we achieve is a bit backward compared to our plan. So do they show the direction or they just show the, the difference? They just show the difference in this study, they compare <laughs> the differences. So that's my question too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And I, I have no, Mandible 可以设计多一点点，对不对？我的建议，对，谢谢。好，谢谢姚医师。So oh, any further question or comments? Okay. Uh, if not, then we proceed to the second paper. The second article will be presented by Dr. Yang. The changes in facial soft tissues after mandibular angle osteotomy based on three-dimensional measurements, a clinical study. Dr. Yang, please. Uh, okay. Good morning, professors and dear colleagues. I'm fourth year resident, Yang Jiarei. Today, I'd like to present the, the article entitled Changes in Facial Soft Tissues After Mandibular Angle Osteotomy. <coughs> Based on 3D measurement, a clinical study, uh, which was just accepted by Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in May 2022. And first in the introduction, uh, several approaches have receiving, uh, recently been described to assess the effects of facial plastic surgery. In addition to the subjective visual evaluation by both fixation and patients, comparison of patient facial morphology before and after plastic surgery has provided a reliable basis for postoperative evaluation. And face assessment was previously carried out based on bone evaluation, while subject appearance was mainly determined by looking at facial soft tissue. <clears throat> And several, um, uh, from a cosmetic perspective, hypertrophy and inversion of the mandibular angle have a significant influence on the facial attractiveness, especially in several Asian societies. And the cause of hypertrophy of the mandibular angle remains unclear. And it is well accepted that abnormal growth of the mandible and hypertrophy of masseta muscles resulting in the pathological changes of the mandibular angle. And mandibular angle osteotomy is a common way to correct hypertrophy of mandibular angle. The bone changes after mandibular angle osteotomy are apparent and can be easily measured, while soft tissue changes are usually less discussed. So the purpose of the, this study 
wants to investigate changes in facial muscles and soft tissue appearance before and after mandibular angle osteotomy and provide reference results for soft tissue evaluation after mandibular angle osteotomy. And the author hypothesized that bone changes in the mandible was accompanied by soft tissue changes in the masseter and temporalis muscle regions of interest, which is called ROI, six months postoperatively, which may also contribute to the alteration of facial soft tissue appearance. And the specific aims of the, this study were to measure and compare the surface area and volume in the ROIs of masseter and temporalis muscles, in addition to other indicators of facial appearance before and six months after mandibular angle osteotomy. And the measurements were performed using 3D reconstructed, 3D CT reconstructed uh, 3D facial models. And next in the method, a bus study designed to analyze changes in facial soft tissue after mandibular angle surgery. The author designed and implemented a single center recontract, uh, retrospective cohort study in the plastic surgery department of nine people's uh, hospital affiliate with Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine. And the study population was composed of female patients for bilateral mandibular angle osteotomy between 2019 and 2020. The author collected CT data from total 29 patients to reconstruct 3D models. <clears throat> to be included in the study sample, a patient should have been diagnosed with bilateral hypertrophy of mandibular angle, which is mainly based on clinical experience. And the faces should be coordinated and symmetrical with normal functional movement. And the patients were excluded if they had obvious uh, facial deformity or symptoms of TMJ disorders and or had previously uh, undergone orthodontic treatment, had inferior alveolar nerve injury, accidental mandibular fracture, or other serious complications after surgery, and whose wound had not been uh, healed completely, or whose facial swelling did not subside six months after surgery. And the pri primary predictor of the study is time, which is preoperative versus six months postoperative. And the primary outcome variable was surface area and total volume of the manually delineated region of interest for both the masseter and temporalis muscles. And second outcome variables were indicators of mandible appearance in soft tissue, including vital mandibular angle distance, mandibular radius heights, and mandibular angle value. And H preoperative BMI and osteotomy volume were chosen as covariates for correlation analysis with outcome variables. And the osteotomy volume was measured using the MIMICS software by comparing preoperative and postoperative CT. And here I explain the data collection method and workflow in this study. First, the selected cases underwent helical CT before surgery and at the six months follow up. And the maximum intercut patient um, was required while they were undergoing CT scans. And the CT files were imported into the rapid form uh, software and the author determined the soft tissue areas with the most obvious changes compared before and six months after surgery. And as you can see the figure, which compared preoperative and postoperative registration image made by Rapiform. And the blue color represents uh, less amount of changes in the tissue, while the red color represents significant changes in the tissue. And the white arrow above points to temporalis regions with the most obvious changes and the white arrow below points to the masseter regions with the most obvious changes. So using that data, 
the author delineated the ROI for both the masseter and temporalis muscles. As you can see the figure, masseter and temporalis muscle ROI was marked in MIMIX software. And the area marked with letter A and represents masseter ROI. And the area marked with letter B represents uh, tempor temporalis muscle ROI. And masseter and temporalis muscle ROI changes can reflect uh, the post-operative changes in the corresponding muscles. Based on CT images, the author also reconstructed 3D models using MIMIX software. From the left figure, CT threshold and software landmarks used to delineate muscle ROI. And from the right figure, the masseta muscle ROI was delimited by a vertical line passing through the lateral canthus, a line connecting the nasal columella and ear lobe, and the mandibular margin line. The temporalis muscle ROI was defined as an upper semicircle with the ear wheel as a center and a line connecting the ear wheel and the lateral canthus as a radius. The important thing is that while the muscle ROIs do not exactly coincide with the actual muscle regions, they sufficiently cover tissue regions with obvious changes six months after surgery in multiple individuals. So using the 3D models, the author then measured the patient's mass data and temporary muscle ROI data before and six months after surgery. And to quantify changes in soft tissue appearance, the author also measured the appearance dependent data for facial soft tissue. They selected indicators related to jaw appearance, including bilateral mandibular angle distance mandibular ramus height and mandibular angle value in the soft tissue. And the, the osteotomy method used in this study was beveled osteotomy with different lengths of the outer and inner plates. And the osteotomy plane was determined by the intersection points of the inferior alveolar plane and the ascending mandibular ramus and the new mandibular angle point and the projection point of the second mandibular molar on the low edge of the mandibular angle. And the osteotomy procedure was usually assisted by the guide plate to ensure, ensure accuracy. So from the left figure, it showed the preoperative design of mandibular angle osteotomy obtained using the MIMIC software. With the assistance of the guide plate, a higher precision during a certain procedure can be achieved. And from the right figure, figure A showed bone fragment obtained from the pre osteotomy on the 3D printed model of the mandible. And figure B showed bone fragment obtained from the actual osteotomy. So here is the results. A total of 29 female patients, mean age was 26 year old, a range from 18 to 37 years between 2019 and 2020 were included in the study. All of them underwent bilateral mandibular angle osteotomy and had CT examinations before and six months after surgery. Their wounds healed well and no patient reported inferior alveolar nerve injury, accidental mandibular fracture or other serious complications. So six months after surgery, the follow-up examination showed that most patients were satisfied with surgical outcomes and felt that um, their appearance had significantly improved. And the degree of opening, uh, opening pattern and chewing function were normal in all the patients. And measurements were performed by two experienced uh, surgeons and the intra-rater and inter-rater agreement coefficients were 0 0.86 and 0 0.82 respectively. But here is the photographs and reconstructed models of the typical case showed facial soft tissue changes six months after surgery. So from the table three, uh, the author mentioned the changes in the surface area and balance of both the masseter and temporary muscle ROI. The results demonstrate that the surface area 
and volumes of both the masseter and temporary muscle ROI were significant changes six months after surgery. And about the changes in facial muscle ROI six months after surgery, from table four, the surface area of the masseter muscles ROI was reduced by 1,463 and 1,077 on the right and left sizes, and respectively. And the masseter muscle ROI volume was reduced by 8,077 and 8,165 on the right and left sides, respectively. And the surface area and total volume of masseter muscle ROI decreased by 14.48% and 18.18% respectively. So, and the author mentioned changes in the uh, surface area and volume of the bilateral temporary muscle ROI. And re the result uh, showed that the surface area uh, of the temporary muscles ROI was in increased by 3,167 and 2,914 on the right and left side, respectively. It was observed that the volume of the temporary muscle ROI increased um, uh, 10,000 and 9,269 on the right and left side, respectively. And the surface area and total volume of temporary muscle ROI increased by 12.4% uh, and 11%, respectively. And all the changes in muscle ROI were statistically significant, which the p-value was less than 0 0.05. And from the <clears throat> table three, the result also showed that the indices of mandibular appearance uh, significant changes after surgery. With respect to linear distance, the author observed that the distance between the two mandibular angles and the length from the earlobe to the mandibular angle decreased postoperatively. And the distance between the bilateral mandibular angle changed from 135.8 before surgery to 125 millimeters after surgery. And the length from the earlobe to the mandibular angle of the facial soft tissue changed from uh, 46 before surgery to 37 uh, after surgery. And the preoperative mandibular angle was 106 degree, and the postoperative mandibular angle was 121 degree. And so, regarding the covariates, the the author assessed their correlation between the uh, with the outcomes. And the figure five uh, showed that the osteotomy volume was uh, correlated with the changes in volume of masseter ROI with the correlation coefficient 0 0.59, and p-value was less than 0 0.01. However, there was no significant correlation between osteotomy volume and the changes in temporalis ROI. And uh, age and preoperative BMI uh, also provide not to be significantly associated with muscle ROI changes with correlation coefficients less than 0 0.3. So uh, about the discussion, first, uh, the purpose of the study was to analyze the changes in facial muscle and facial soft tissue appearance six months after mandibular angle osteotomy and to provide uh, empirical data for post-operative effect evaluation. And the author hypothesized that bone changes in the mandible were accompanied uh, by soft tissue changes in the masseter and temporalized muscle ROI six months postoperatively. And the results they have put, reported uh, confront their hypothesis. At the same time, they also found that postoperative facial soft tissue changes were associated with bone changes. And a widely contoured low face is determined by the morphology and thickness of the both soft tissue and hard tissues. And it may be caused by various conditions in bone tissues, such as hypertrophy of the mandibular angle, oversized mandible body, and inversion of the mandible. And high volume buccal fat pad 
and muscle to muscle covering the mandible could also be an important factor for hypertrophy of mandibular angle appearance. And hypertrophy of the mandible uh, angle is typically accompanied by hypertrophy of masseter muscle. In masseter muscle, hypertrophy not only leads to a visually wider lower face, but also be related to the uh, more development of mandible. So uh, some studies concluded that mandible with a strong attached con contratile uh, masseter <clears throat> have a particularly high rate of bone growth. And the temporalis and masseter muscle positively correlated with cranial facial width. And masseter and external pterygoid muscle were associated with height uh, of mandible ascending ramus. So there are open changes in both facial soft tissue and the bone tissue after mandible angles or cetomeres. And the changes in soft tissue may also contribute to post-operative changes in appearance. And here, uh, the author said some studies use 3D CT reconstruction to measure and compare the volume and cross-sectional area of masseter muscles in different CT plans before and after mandibular angle acetomy. They found that the masseter muscle spontaneously shrank after the procedure, which supported the author's findings. And the key point here from the author is that the reduction in the weight of the mandibular bone and atrophy of the surrounding soft tissue may be the common cause of postoperative changes in the visual appearance of the mandible. And the author found that the soft tissue area and total volume of the masseter muscles were reduced by 12.8% and 18.4% respectively six months after mandibular angle acetomy. In addition, the surface area and total volume of the temporalis muscle increased by 12% and 10.7% res respectively. So for masseter muscle atrophy, the author speculated that changes in, in local muscle tension caused by traumatic operation and subsequent muscle disuse may attribute to masseter muscle atrophy. For temporalis muscle hypertrophy, the author speculated the bilateral temporal, temporal muscle undergoing compensatory hyperplasia to mention certain mastication abilities. Because there were no significant changes in the temporalis muscle during surgery, the expansion was more likely to, due to increased muscle activities. And, and <clears throat> the 3D reconstruction of the skull tissue can assist it, uh, researchers in designing surgical plans, calculating the amount of correction required for acetomy and predicting postoperative changes in the bone tissue. However, uh, postoperative facial changes are not limited to bone tissue. In this study, the author looked to uh, measure and compare facial soft tissues of patients before and after mandibular angle acetomy and analyze actual changes in soft tissue after surgery, thereby providing objective data to assessing changes in appearance after surgery. Utilizing this method, they have produced empirical data to help evaluate uh, appearance after mandibular angle acetomy. So the key points uh, the, uh, of the discussion from the author here is that the treatment of mandibular angle hypertrophy one should not only concentrate on the partial resection of the mandible, but also take into account of the reduction of masseter muscle. So due to traditional beauty standards, particularly in East Asia, smooth facial contours are often considered more uh, cosmetically appeal appealing. And the position and angle value of the mandible angle points are key factors that influence the profile of the lower face. There are few unified uh, diagnostic criteria for hypertrophy of mandibular angle, and several studies have provided their data on facial measurements. So finally, uh, this study recorded the post-operative changes in the masseter and temporalis muscle ROI and compared them, finding them 
fighting that both muscle ROI had significant post-operative changes, indicating that soft tissue may also play a role in the appearance changes after mandibular angle acetomy. And post-operative atrophy of masseter muscle ROI and expansion of the temporalis muscle ROI also give the author some therapeutic insight. Post-operative patients with sunken temporal temples or masseter muscle hypertrophy should be observed for a period of pain time until the soft tissue are stabilized before deciding whether to implement corrective treatment such as masseter muscle <clears throat> Botox injection or temple fat filling. And the changes in facial appearance after mandibular angle acetomy have always been subjectively ev evaluated and recorded by 2D photographs, which lack measure measurable indicators and objective quantification. So about the strengths of this study, the author used 3D CT images for measurement, and they provide an in-depth evaluation of the degree of changes in medieval appearance after surgery and provide a more detailed reference for both the public and medical communities. And the author also said that there were some limitations in their study. At first, the sample size was relatively small, which was only 29 patients. And there was only one uh, post follow-up time point at six months. So in the conclusion, there are three points. The first, the author observed statically uh, significant levels of atrophy of the masseta muscle ROI and expansion of the temporalized muscle ROI six months after mandibular angle acetomy, which may account for appearance changes after surgery. Second, they also found that acetomy volume positively correlated with post-operative post mass, mass, masseta ROI changes. And last, uh, the study provided empirical evidence illustrating soft tissue alteration in patients who have undergone mandibular and uh, Here's my uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, we would like to invite Frank Zhang, Dr. Frank Zhang. Uh, do you have some comments on this uh, article? Did you, did you see a similar uh, condition that after after maybe the injection of Botox to the uh, masseta muscle, there will be some compensatory uh, temporized muscle hypertrophy. Did you see that? Uh, yes, uh, this is a very well conducted uh, study. We know uh, by experience that the, the soft tissue change will be altered by uh, H, BMI, and the masseta muscle volume. The only concern of this study is the age range is too uh, wide, from 18 to 37. We know that older age with less uh, tissue redrooping and the more uh, droop, uh, uh, redundancy of soft tissue after surgery. So the only concern is this. The BMI, they, they have a uh, control of BMI. So uh, higher BMI patient has less responsive to uh, surgery. Uh, the final is the masseta muscle, as uh, Dr. Links mentioned previous, uh, our study of uh, masseter, uh, there's a 35% of muscle reduction at three months after surgery, but no change of temporalis, medial pterygoid muscle, and the lateral pterygoid muscle. It's interesting that this study show there's a 18% reduction masseter muscle, muscle and the 10% of increase of temporalis muscle. Uh, we also found that uh, one, two, three years after surgery, there's some re regrowth of uh, bone and, uh, and uh, I think also might have some uh, return of masseter muscle because uh, uh, return to usual use because uh, 
we we detach all the muscle insertion that uh in the first uh, six months, there's a reduction in certain muscle uh, burden. But after the patient start to reuse it, I think the certain muscle will be returned to its original size. It's interesting that they, they did not report the medial and the lateral uh, pterygoid muscle, but I think it's interesting to investigate the medial and lateral pterygoid muscle also. And uh, finally, uh, I think I know that the Korea is using, they have a machine, they, they are using the radio frequency intraoperatively to reduce muscle to muscle. They just burn up the muscle to muscle with about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, simultaneous uh, angle resection and the muscle muscle uh, volume reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang. And Dr. Zhou, do you have some comments? And uh, my question is that he, they, they use the CT to, to measure the changes. And how about the, the 3D MD photographic system? Yes. Uh, actually, for the CT, the evaluation is uh, most clearly to know the soft tissue and the hard tissues, the border, uh, not be influenced by some facial recognizable anatomical landmark. For example, for, from the CDMD, uh, we could really very easily to know where is the eye, nose, and the mouth uh, based on their cancers or ala or the commissures. However, once we only use the 3D, uh, we use the uh, CT data, you can see like this, uh, this uh, slide, uh, you can easily to know this is a soft tissue, <laughs> but all the landmarking is not so um, easily be influenced by once the patient open his eye <clears throat> or uh, open his mouth. So only the one single color, and let you more easily to know and to know where is the ROI. Yeah, because uh, sometimes once we use the simulation for the OGS, uh, you can see the professor, they are always use the CD uh, sub tissue software and to, to let us know where is the uh, movement for the probably the simulation data. But for some the orthodontic surgeon, they would like to use the CD and D. Yeah, so they have the different stories. So for me, I think <clears throat> once you, we only have the one single facility to do the study, uh, single the 3D CT is quite enough to give us the design of information to probably the segment, the bone and all the soft tissue. Yeah, so this is my, my experience. Thank you. Um, uh... Professor Ray Chen, do you have some comments? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, mm, about 15 years ago, Professor Lo and us that we published one paper on the long-term follow-up of the regeneration of the muscle or bone of the medieval angle, which published in the annals. I had only six cases that we follow up six years, five, six years, with uh, follow-up uh, two, three, two times, three times of CT, uh, including pre-op and post-op immediately. Uh, that means about one month to three months, and then six years or five years. Well, the result is similar to Frank Zhang mentioned about uh, some muscle is regenerated back, some bone is regenerated back. Well, for this kind of study, I think uh, we can do whatever uh, easy for us. It's only a CT. And uh, for long-term follow-up, uh, surely we can follow up the same as CT. But what I will mention is that uh, the patient's concern is different. Everybody that have different concern about their own base. The second is that uh, I think the muscle reduction or Botox injection or fat augmentation and all this, uh, I think this is a kind of individual uh, 
aesthetic and we should do more. I, I think that Frank uh, can publish or, or, or in our workshop more so that we have more consensus and then study on that. As Dr. Frank Tang mentioned about, it's interesting to see the temporary change. I think that's maybe a temporary because uh, the temporary muscle is not related to the surgery part at all. If we follow up maybe one year after, maybe return to back to the original. The last thing I will mention about is that mandible angle prominence besides the masseter muscle, but mandible angle can happen uh, overgrowth posteriorly and as well medially. And uh, if we reset on the low margin and out of out cortex, in some patients, they do not change that much of the bony uh, shape. Uh, so it's a, it's a different uh, direction of the overgrowth. And then can happen when they want to have a, some part of the mangle angle, but uh, how we can achieve that. So that will be an interesting thing that we can study on. We do not have many, many cases of this, but if we publish our, uh, or we show our own patients, maybe that we can increase some of this kind of patients in our center as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any further question or comment? Uh, if not, then we close the meeting and thank you for, for joining the meeting and see you next week. Thank you.